This video is supported by Brilliant. We've all gotten used to hearing about COVID over the last couple of years and all the weird things that it can do to the body, all the weird effects that it has. But one of the weirdest has to be that it can actually take away your sense of smell. Remember when it was still new and we were still learning things about all the time, how weird it was? And remember panicking anytime you smelled something and it wasn't quite as strong as you thought it should be? Like we only have five senses and for some reason, two years later, for reasons we still don't understand, this disease turns one of them off. Like imagine if it temporarily made you blind or deaf or you, you couldn't feel anything that you touched. I guess there are other diseases that do that actually. But the point is everybody who had that experience talks about how weird it was to lose their sense of smell, how it ruins the ability to eat food because everything just kind of tastes like Elmer's glue. I guess don't know what you got till it's gone. But there are some instances where not having a sense of smell would probably be a good thing. For instance, if you were to ever run across a chemical called thioacetone, which is considered by many to be the absolute worst smell in the world. What's the worst thing you ever smelled? Really, think about it. Put it in the comments. I bet just thinking about it brings you back to a vivid memory of some kind. Probably not a good one. Maybe even one that traumatized you in some way. And now you're spiraling into a dark abyss of pain that you thought you had escaped. A door you had permanently closed and now you're trapped inside of it, screaming inexorably into the uncaring void. Sorry, I just made you do that. But that's the power of smell. It's wired directly into our emotional centers. It's our most primal sense that we have. And we still don't really understand it. I know that sounds like clickbait, but it's true. There's no single agreed upon theory about how smell works. What we do know is that a smell happens when an odor molecule binds with a receptor within the nasal cavity. That smell is then interpreted by the glomerulus, which gets a bunch of information from other receptors in the nose called olfactory receptor neurons, and then combines all that info together into what we call smell. And that's about as deep as our understanding goes. We, we know that there's certain molecules that fit into certain receptors in our noses, but we don't fully understand the mechanisms behind it. There are a few theories. There's the docking theory of olfaction, which proposes a very one-to-one -one match. It's kind of like a lock and key situation where a molecule key fits into a receptor lock. Each receptor is either on or off, and the number of different receptors tells the brain how to interpret it. The ototype theory is similar to the docking theory, except that molecules can fit several different types of receptors and vice versa. It's more a matter of processing the signal through the noise. And then there's a vibration theory of olfaction. This says that the molecules fit into receptors, but the receptors are actually interpreting the vibrations of the molecules at an atomic level. This one is actually pretty controversial. It also posits that uh, quantum tunneling is involved in some way, which is pretty nuts. Uh, and it's very heavily debated. I just think it's funny that, that smell science has drama involved in it. But because we don't know exactly how it works, that means that we can't really measure stink. Or I should say we can measure the concentration of a smell, but we can't measure whether or not a smell is good or bad. That's sort of a, a subjective thing. You know, one person's dripping gasoline is another person's bouquet of roses. Noses are weird. So there's no objective scale of smell, like say spice has Scoville units, you know, you can actually measure the amount of capsaicin that's in, uh, in food and, and, and objectively come up with a number to quantify how spicy that is. What we can gather is people's reactions to a stink and how universally loved or hated it is. And then we can determine how easily it can be detected when it's dispersed into air. And then from that, of course, we can create a weapon out of it. Because human's gonna human. Yes, the US Department of Defense did study smell for a while in order to create some kind of non-lethal stink bomb to use against the enemy. Stink bomb, who knows what that does? Oh! <laughs> One person who consulted on this stink bomb project is a cognitive psychologist named Pamela Dalton. She said that the DOD had actually created a large inventory of different smells to choose from and gave her access to their stink inventory. She zeroed in on one that the government had created that uh, its purpose was to simulate large military latrines that they would then test cleaning products on. From this base of stink, Dalton created what she called the stench soup, and she described the smell of this soup as, quote, Satan sitting on a throne of onions. She said she, she couldn't imagine a worse smell. Well, she might not be able to imagine it, but it turns out there is a worse smell. Far worse. In 1889, German scientists were working with a chemical called trithioacetone, which is a fairly harmless chemical. It's actually used as a flavoring in some candies today. But as they were messing around with this chemical, they, they cracked the molecule, turning trithioacetone into just thioacetone. 
And while good things may come in threes, it turns out one is the loneliest number. Because this compound smells in a profound way, like almost supernatural. Okay, so let me take a second and explain to you exactly what I wanted to do with this video. Like I heard about thioacetone and my YouTuber clickbait brain went off and I was like, I'm gonna get my hands on some of this. And I'm gonna go down to the park and I'm gonna smear a little bit on a tree and then like go hide somewhere and catch people's reactions as they walk by. I mean, I'm not really into prank videos. That's not really what I do here, but smell is a very hard thing to get across visually. So I wanted somebody to react to it, either somebody, other, you know, strangers at the park or myself. But I was gonna have a title that was like, I got my hands on the smelliest substance in the world. And I was gonna put my wow face on there with a red circle randomly. I mean, I was ready to sell out big time. But then I read some of the stories about thioacetone and uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Because yeah, when those German scientists first created thioacetone, they accidentally spilled a little bit of it. And apparently one little quirk of thioacetone is that it dissipates and moves through the air so fast that the people standing right next to it don't smell it immediately. And by the time they picked up on the smell of it in their lab, people were already vomiting and passing out in the streets of Freiburg. A newspaper at the time described it as, quote, an offensive smell which spread rapidly over a great area of the town causing fainting, vomiting, and a panic evacuation. They literally tipped over their beaker and people were evacuating their homes and businesses up to a half a mile away within seconds. That is some fast stank. Thioacetone popped up again in England in 1967. British researchers Victor Burnop and Kenneth Latham were experimenting with thioketones, trying to create some new, synthesize some new polymers and whatnot, uh, when something terrible happened. They left a bottle of residue open for a moment, just a few seconds, and just that, caused a building 200 yards away filled with people to be overwhelmed with odor and nausea followed. The official report from the researchers at the station said, quote, we recently found ourselves with an odor problem beyond our worst expectations. During early experiments, a stopper jumped from a bottle of residues and although replaced at once, resulted in an immediate complaint of nausea and sickness from colleagues working in a building 200 yards away. Literally opened a bottle for a few seconds and people were sick in a different building 200 yards away, two football fields away, like just... Around that same time, Professor Mayer at the Dresden University of Technology was also playing around with thioketones and had heard about thioacetone, wanted to experience it for himself, immediately regretted it. He said, quote, the smell of this unstable red oil is indeed almost indescribable. He calls it red. I've heard it described as brown and orange as well. Oh, and another thing about thioacetones, it lingers. As if that pungent smell wasn't bad enough, apparently it gets kind of sticky and clings to clothes and hair and stuff. There was a story of some chemists that had uh, been exposed to thioacetone, and even though they cleaned themselves off and followed all the protocols and whatnot, apparently later that day they went to a restaurant and it smelled so bad that so many people complained to the manager about it that the manager of the restaurant came out and started spraying them with deodorant. But all of these stories are from a long time ago. It's actually hard to find any recent research that's been done on thioacetone. I think because uh, they, they found out what they needed to find out about it. Like, it doesn't seem to have any other uses whatsoever. It just smells really, really, really bad. The end. It's literally like a WMD of smell. It's just, it's just not worth messing with. Because it turns out smelly spills happen all the time. One of these spills happened in the city of Rouen in Normandy, France. There's a chemical plant there run by Lubrizol, and in 2013, they had a large chemical spill. That chemical was heated by the air and caused a smell of rotten eggs that apparently traveled for hundreds of miles. They could smell it as far away as London. People in Rouen reported feeling nauseous and getting migraines from it. The chemical that was spilled? Not thioacetone. It was actually his baby brother, Mercaptan, which is what they put in natural gas to you know, be able to detect leaks. The gas is odorless but they add the smell so you know when there's a leak. <laughs> yeah, the use of mercaptan in gas lines goes back to, you guessed it, the Victorians. I mentioned in one of my many Victorian videos that when, uh, in the early days of using natural gas in homes, a lot of people died because they had gas leaks in their homes and it overtook them. Well, they started adding mercaptan to it so that people could actually smell the gas. The human nose can detect 1.6 parts per billion of mercaptan. So you can imagine how strong that smell was when pure mercaptan got spilled and started blowing all over Europe. And the reason is the sulfur in the molecule. The human nose is so good at picking up sulfur, it's thought that even one molecule of it can be detected. 
Fun fact, the human nose is also really good at picking out the smell of vanilla. The, the scientific term is vanillin. Uh, the, the, the threshold for that is so low, it's actually, I gotta look at it. It's 2.0 times 10 to the negative seven milligrams per meter cubed. Yeah, apparently if you took an oil tanker full of vanillin and tipped it over, it would make the entire planet smell like vanilla. The entire planet. Which would kind of turn the whole planet into Disneyland. They, they do that at Disneyland. They pipe vanilla smell into Main Street. But back to thioacetone. Why? Why is this stuff so bad? Especially when you consider that it's derived from something that's so harmless they put it in candy. Chemistry's weird. Thioacetone is derived from the thiol group. In other words, sulfur. Thiols are basically sulfur analogs of alcohol, the thi being sulfur and all being alcohol. And it's thought that humans evolved to avoid sulfur compounds because sulfur is usually emitted by rotten things. Rotten things also carry disease and, and death. Stink, saving lives. And after a couple hundred thousand years of evolutionary pressures, we are now completely grossed out by the smell of dumpsters and a warm summer breeze. I'm looking at you, South Dallas. But ultimately, that's what our sense of smell is supposed to do, what all of our senses are supposed to do, just keep us alive. Bioacetone just really shows how powerful chemistry can be and possibly dangerous. I mean, could you imagine if a tanker full of thioacetone spilled over? Would it have the same effect as vanilla? Would it coat the entire world in a stench of rotten crap? But luckily, that's very unlikely to happen. Again, there's not really a lot of use for thioacetone, so there's not a whole lot of it being made. Like, it's so bad that you can't even weaponize it, which is why the DOD was looking at other compounds and not really at thioacetone, because, like, if you were trying to smoke somebody out of a building or, or disperse a crowd, you would wind up making all of your own people pass out. So even though my original plan for this video got thwarted, I don't know, maybe it's better for some things to remain a mystery. Maybe, maybe thioacetone being on a shelf in a big building with the Ark of the Covenant in it somewhere, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the best plan. Researching into this episode made me um, appreciate my nose, as weird as that sounds. I found myself taking time to really smell <laughs> the environment around me. You know, we, we kind of get used to smells that we're around all the time. We call it nose blind or smell blindness. But you know, just, just being more aware of it and thinking about it as I breathe just kind of enhanced the experience of life. And smell is also powerfully tied to our emotions and our memories, like I was talking about before, you know, we're, we're very connected to a certain smell. You might smell something that smells like your grandmother's house or the cookies that your mom used to bake, and it would just take you right back there. Apparently one of the lowest concentrations of smell that humans can detect is the smell of rain. That's a scent called geosmin, and apparently 400 parts per trillion can be picked up by our nose. It shows you just how well refined our little booger factory is. So it's not all horrible. You know, I asked you at the beginning of the video to think of the worst smell that you've ever smelled. Maybe we can end things on an upbeat. What's the best thing you've ever smelled? What's your favorite smell? What's a smell that just takes you back mentally and emotionally to a place that you once cherished? And maybe as you go about your day, you know, take a moment from time to time to just sort of focus on the smell and, and the, the environment around you. Not only is it something that can kind of enhance the experience of living, it's something that kind of grounds you and keeps you in the moment, which is always a good thing. What's also a good thing is getting a little bit smarter with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Like I said before, chemistry is weird. One little reaction can turn a candy flavoring into the world's worst stink bomb. And you can find out why this happens in Brilliant's chemical reaction course. Through 15 interactive lessons covering 180 exercises, this course will teach you everything from acids and bases to moles and Avogadro's number, reaction energetics, stoichiometry, and more. And if all that stuff sounds way over your head, don't worry, it won't be. Because Brilliant uses visual and interactive lessons to teach you by solving problems, which is something we all know how to do on a certain level. It kind of hacks this innate problem-solving ability that we all have and uses it to teach us fundamental concepts that you can then build upon until the next thing you know, you're doing advanced math and science that you always thought was out of your reach. It's a great gift for kids who are struggling to learn in the traditional school setting, or if you're an adult and you just always wish you had a better handle on it, well, here's your chance. It's never too late. So if you've been on the fence about Brilliant, you can actually try out the first couple of lessons on every single one of their courses. And if you enjoy that and you think it's worth checking out, um, you can go to brilliant.org slash anxiouswithjoe and get 20% off your subscription that gives you access to all of their lessons. Now this only applies for the first 200 people to sign up, so don't wait. Again, it's brilliant.org slash anxiouswithjoe. Link's down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are forming an awesome community and giving me great feedback and just being incredible people. Got a few names to murder real quick. These are new members. We got Elizabeth Wagner, Christina Carr, Sean G, Dharma Hetherington, 
Love the spam, spam, <laughs> Sawyer Mirage, Tiger Shower Darby, uh, Jill Renee, Cameron Miller, Leo, Quince, J, KJF, and Bobby L. Nelson. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos, also get a little uh, little avatar, a little, little thing by your name to stand out in the comments. Uh, you can just uh, hit the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, um, Google thinks you might like this one too, so you might check that one out. Or any of the others that have my little face on them down the side, and if you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos every Monday, and sometimes Thursday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.